for organizing this, this event in this very difficult time. And I'm talking from Madrid, from virtual Madrid, let's say. So, and also I would like to thank them for, for inviting me to be there, to talk in this, in this uh, conference. So, um, oh, that is a problem. So I have been working in the in the field of uh, let's say classical nanophotonics for the last 25 years, and within this area of research, the goal is to tune or tailor uh, material properties and geometry to control the the flow of light. So these are the three typical examples. Uh, in photonic crystals, uh, you play with the periodicity of dielectric structures. In the case of plasmonics, uh, you take advantage of the surface plasmon polaritons that are propagating along the surface. Uh, sorry, along the surface of, of a metal surface, and then you can create, like in this uh, uh, picture, some even some photonic circuits based on uh, on plasmons. And in this case, you take advantage of the negative epsilon that is characterizing. A metal uh, surface, and of course, the last example is these metamaterials in which you have to, you can have both negative epsilon and negative mu, and then you can create very nice optical phenomena such as uh, cloaking, perfect lensing, and, and many other things. So, there is a problem with the screen. Apparently, this block. I don't know what is the problem. So I cannot advance with the. So Herman. Uh, ah, okay. So the since the last uh, seven or eight years, there is a new quantum twist in in nanophotonics, so, and the idea is here is to use light. So is the, to work the other way around is to use light, in this case, the vacuum field, to modify material properties. So in order to do so, the idea is to confine light in a space to get a strong single photon interaction with interesting materials. So uh, in order to confine light, you are going to use nanophotonics, classical nanophotonics, plasmonics, in order to confine light. In the, uh, for single photon interaction, you are going to use the tools of cavity QED, quantum optics, and we are interested on changing material properties or chemical properties of interesting materials. Okay, so this is a very important transparency. So the work that I'm going to talk today is, uh, has been carried out by many uh, researchers, by several uh, PhD students, brilliant PhD students and postdocs. And at the beginning of this project, uh, it was funded by this grant, by the Plasma and Quanta grant. And a key figure in this ERC was Johannes Feist that he was able to get uh, an ERC starting grant for young researchers. And we have continued working along these lines. And also we are funded by this Quantera project that is called Towards a Room Temperature Quantum Technologies. And also I have to acknowledge the uh, collaboration with people in, in my department in Madrid, Antonio Fernando Dominguez and Esteban Moreno. Okay, so this is the outline of the talk because this audience is more <laughs> on condensed matter physics. I'm going to try to introduce a strong coupling and the, and the fundamentals. Then I will focus on how it's possible to control chemical reactions by a strong coupling, what is called this area of research for atomic chemistry. Then I will pass uh, about how to, you can control uh, energy transport mediated by collective strong coupling. And also I will finish with uh, there are just five four or five transparencies talking about new developments, taking this idea from organic materials to condensed matter. So manipulating condensed matter by means of a strong coupling. Okay, so let's start with um, the introduction. So basically this is the typical setup in cavity QED. You have a quantum emitter inside a cavity. So basically this quantum emitter is represented by a two level system and uh, basically, uh, what the cavity does is changing the electromagnetic environment, and you can say that dress the vacuum by changing the electromagnetic density of states. Okay, so one way to, to uh, deal with this kind of system is the, to use 
the James Cummings Hamiltonian, that in the case of a single excitation subspace is basically represented by this two by two Hamiltonian. So you have the set of the meter, so this is the frequency. You have to include losses in your cavity emitter by this gamma. You have the cavity photon. Again, you have this omega zero that usually is the same as, as the electronic excitations in the, in the atom on the quantum emitter. And of course, you have also cavity losses. And the important point is this coupling. So this coupling basically is proportional to both the transition dipole moment of the quantum emitter and the uh, quantized electric field. And this quantized electric field is proportional to one over the square root of the volume occupied by this uh, electric field, by this cavity electric field. So basically all the physics is included in this. Uh, you have the hybridization between these two levels and all the important physics appears inside this square. Okay, in the case of uh, weak coupling, when G, sorry, when G is smaller than, than the losses in the system and gamma and kappa, basically what the cavity is doing is just modifying the radiative decay. So it's the so-called Purcell effect. And if you look into the population versus time, you have an exponential decay. And the, this, the decay length of this exponential is modified by the cavity field. But if G is larger than uh, gamma and kappa, what well, you have, this is, real, this is positive, so th then you have the real quantity. So basically, what you are creating is the hybridization. You are creating a lower polariton mode and an upper polariton mode, separated by the so-called Rabi splitting, that basically is proportional to this G, by the way. And then you have new hybrid light matter states that are called polaritons. And accordingly, you are going to have, if you look into the population, for example, in the quantum emitter, you are going to have some oscillations that are called Rabi oscillations. <clears throat> okay, so it's very difficult to, to achieve a, a strong coupling at the single quantum level. So the more feasible way to do this is by considering n quantum emitters and inside the cavity, like in this case. In this case, the, the model is called Tavis Cummings model. And the physics is very similar to the case of a single quantum emitter. The only difference is that you have now only one combination of the uh, states in the emitters are coupled to the cavity mode, that is called the bright state. And then when the coupling is uh, strong enough, you are going to have a lower polariton and an upper polariton. And because there are n minus one states into the, the collective emitters that they don't couple to the cavity mode, you are going to have n minus one, n minus one dark states. So this is the, the main difference between collective strong coupling and single uh, strong coupling. And but the important point is that as you see, uh, both the lower polariton and the upper polariton and even the darkest states are going to be the localized in the whole structure. So this is very important. So the important point is that now the enhancement of the, of the Rabi splitting is proportional to the square root of the number of emitters that you have in your system. So basically you can, in some way you can achieve more easily a strong coupling. Okay, a bit of history about the strong coupling. So uh, at the beginning, the much effort was put in with, with Rick Beratoms and the uh, key leading figure for, was uh, uh, Serge Haroche. And then they were able to achieve for the first time uh, a strong coupling at the single quantum level. And, and in this case, because the coupling of these Rick Beratoms with the cavity field was very small, that they, they, they have to use quasi-perfect uh, uh, cavities in order to uh, have uh, very small losses. In the context of context matter physics, there have been a lot of efforts in doing a strong coupling with single quantum dots in different semiconductor microcavity systems, like uh, in this case, a vertical mi microcavity, and in this case, in a photonic crystal dynamic. And also, all, all these excitons are, let's say, localized in space, but also you can achieve a, a strong coupling with Bannier mode excitons that are uh, typical of inorganic semiconductor. You have these excitons in these quantum wells. And then you have this cavity that is created by this DBR. And the problem of this structure is that the excitons only exist at very low temperature. So it's very, so you have to work at, at very low temperature in order to have a strong coupling. So the youngest uh, members of the family of these uh, exciton polaritons are the polaritons associated to the coupling between the excitons in this atomic crystal that is transition decalcogenides. And you can see that they, they can achieve some uh, probably splitting and, and etc. The interesting point about this structure and for, for people working in context matter is that 
the polaritons that you have in this after this strong coupling inherit the helicity of the exciton. So you are including the spin component in the uh, polaritonics. So what about the uh, organic molecules? Organic molecules present a, a very good case for, for a strong coupling because first you have a very large dipole moment and they present high densities. So you look into the expression of the Rabi splitting that is basically proportional to the square root of n divided by the volume of the, of the quantized electric field, you can see that you can both enhance the density and the transition dipole. So in principle, even in some cases, you can achieve Rabi splittings of the order of one EV, that is a large fraction of the transition energy. And importantly, and this is one of the main assets of, um, of a strong coupling with organic molecules is that you can work at room temperature. That's a difference with the exciton polariton that I mentioned before. So the first, well, one of the first experiments so in a strong coupling with, um, with organic molecules, it was done by Litzi in uh, 98 of the last century. And they, they were using a cavity that was a silver mirror. And the other mirror is, was just a, this called a DDR. That is basically a one dimensional photonic crystal. Okay? And then you can create a cavity. And in this case, the Rabi splitting that they, they were able to achieve it was of the order of 0.1 or 0.2 EVs. Uh, the, the group of Beleza in, in Lyon, they were, I mean, and I put this example because uh, a cavity doesn't need to be a closed cavity. It can be an open cavity. Like for example, the only thing that you need for a strong coupling is uh, a localized electromagnetic mode. And for example, a surface plasmon polariton can provide you this localized electric field. And they were able also to, to have just an organic layer on top of a metal surface and they achieve also a strong coupling. More recently, the group of uh, Jeremy Bomber in, in Cambridge, they have been able to uh, reach the limit of a strong coupling at the single quantum level by putting just few molecules in the gap region between the metal nanoparticle and a metal surface. Okay. So why is a strong coupling so interesting for, for so the, all the possible applications of, of uh, strong coupling are based on the fact that polaritons are hybrid light matter state and they inherit the properties from both constituents. From light, they have extremely low mass and they have coherence. And from molecular excitations, they have mutual interactions. So in principle, there is a wide range of possible applications for polariton, mainly seen as dressed photons. The idea is that with polaritons, you are incorporating interaction to the photons. So, and one typical example is this uh, polariton condensation and lacing that was firstly achieved with uh, inorganic semiconductors in this paper. They will have uh, polariton condensation and they have also lacing. And for the case of uh, organic molecules, uh, it was reported uh, in 2010. So, but since the last eight years or seven years, the, 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 there is another way around that is to use a strong coupling to take organic materials into new directions. So this just to use a strong coupling to modify material properties. And these are the, the two seminal experiments in this direction that they were performed in the group of uh, Thomas Evesen in, in the University of Estrasburg. In the first case, they were reporting that you can increase or you can modify uh, the chemical reaction rates by putting organic molecules inside the fabri perot cavity and put it in resonance. Uh, to achieve a strong coupling, you, you have to have a bond resonance. And in the second experiment that it was published in Nature Materials five years ago, they observed an increase of the electrical conductivity of uh, an organic material by under the strong coupling with the surface plasmon supported by uh, a metal film that is, uh, that is a whole array arrangement. Okay? So this was the motivation of, of, of the seminal experiments in this, in this direction. Okay, so controlling chemical reactions by means of a strong coupling. So I'm going to talk about how I mean, the, the fundamental physics associated to the possibility of controlling chemical reactions by means of a strong coupling, what is called uh, polaritonic chemistry. Okay, so if one of the problems that we faced at the beginning in, in, in our research is uh, that normally you try to, to use the tools of the uh, of cavity QED normally, uh, a quantum an organic molecule is just a two-level system. But if you want to do chemistry, the best concept that you can work on is the potential energy surface. Because with potential energy surface, it's a function of the reaction coordinate, 
you can describe reactions, you can describe non-relativity. And what we found is that uh, when you have a molecule inside uh, a metal cavity, and then you, not a metal cavity, a general cavity, and then you achieve a strong coupling, you can understand uh, the physics or the chemistry in this case by, of, of, of a possible chemical reaction by following the nuclear motion on polaritonic potential energy surface, what we call poles. I'm going to explain very easily this, this concept. So if you have a bare molecule, this is a typical energy versus nuclear coordinate or reaction coordinate. You have the ground state and then you have the excited state. Okay, so this is the bare molecule uh, for just one reaction coordinate. If now you include this molecule, this molecule inside the cavity, and then you are working in the single excitation subspace, now the excitation can be either in the, in the molecule, so you have this orange core, or it can be in the cavity. So in this case, if the photon is in the cavity, the, um, the molecule is in the ground state. So basically, then you have this possibility that is just to shift the uh, ground state by the energy of the cavity. Of course, if, if the coupling is weak, there is no, let's say, connection between these two surfaces, but you apply a kind of James Cummings Hamiltonian as a function of the reaction coordinate, and if this G is strong enough, then you can achieve, or you can reach a situation in, in which you have a lower polariton potential energy surface and an upper polariton potential energy surface. Okay, it's just the hybridization between these two energy surfaces. Okay, so basically the idea, the whole idea of polaritonic chemistry is don't guide the way, but change the road. You are changing the energy landscape of uh, in which your molecule is, is, is moving. So can we control chemical reactions? So this is the first example that we did that we try to, to model uh, the photoisomerization reaction. In this case, there are some molecules, still beans and other kinds of, of molecules in, in which there are two phases. So in the ground state, you have these two minima that they have the same energy in this case. And the system, if the system absorbs a photon, it goes to the set of the state and okay, following the Cassius rule, they go in this one and then you have a non-radiative uh, reaction to the other one. So you can go from the trans configuration to the cis configuration by absorbing a photon. So it's a photochemical reaction. So in this case is what we call an spherical cow version of, of a molecule but because it's only one degree of freedom. It's just to show the potentiality of, uh, of polaritonic chemistry. Okay, so this is what happens in, in when you have the bare molecule, you have the, and this is the, just a, a simulation of how the, the nuclear wave packet evolves after absorbing a, a photon, and okay, you end up. So if now you include this molecule in a cavity, and then you are able to achieve uh, a strong coupling, then you can, uh, you can reach this situation in which by hybridization between this uh, potential energy surface and the other one that is associated to the set of the state, then in this case, or, or some parameters, you can create a potential well, well for the nuclear wave packet. So in this case, you can see that you can trap the wave packet in this polariton surface, and then you can suppress photoisomerization. Okay, this is a, a nice and simple example of how you can do, how you can control chemical reactions by taking advantage of, of a strong coupling. So this idea has been uh, verified in two different experiments. One by the group of Timor Sekai, uh, in which they were able to see a suppression of photooxidation of organic chromophores. In this case, they were using as a cavity, that is a very open cavity, just a, a, a triangular metal nanoparticle. And in this case, in, in the group of Noginov in the US, they were using a fabriper of cavity. In this case, they were uh, suppressing the photodegradation under a strong light matter. Okay, suppression uh, has a negative uh, meaning. So what about enhancing chemical reaction? This is the second example that we did. In this case, we were trying to simulate uh, some molecules that have been proposed for solar energy storage. They have two minima, and one of them is the metastable state, and the other one is the stable state, let's say. And in this, the idea is to store the energy in this metastable state, and, okay, you absorb a photon, then you go to this, uh, a set of the state, and then you release the energy. In this case, if you look into the quantum deal of this photochemical reaction, 
in this case is uh, 44%. And by using the ideas of polar electronic chemistry, you can increase this uh, quantum yield by very simple. If now you uh, are, you include this molecule inside a cavity and then you achieve a strong coupling, you can see that if the hybridization is uh, strong enough, you can create a new reaction pathway for the nuclear wave packet and you can end in this point, and in this point, you are going to have a quantum yield of 100%. Okay. What about dynamics? As I said before, um, uh, there are some experiments that show that it's possible to put a, a molecule in, in this gap region between a metal nanoparticle and a flat metal surface. And in this group, in particular in this, in this uh, reference, this experimental group was, was able to send a ultra fast uh, laser pulse in this region and to analyze the emission of, of, the, of the system. The important point about this kind of, of experiments is that everything is ultra fast. So you have a very short pulse driving that is of the order of femtoseconds. In your case, the plasma lifetime, the typical plasma lifetime is the order also of femtoseconds. The rabi oscillation, if the strong coupling is strong enough, it can be also of the order of femtoseconds. And you have, of course, the, the nuclear dynamics that can be also in the femtosecond range. So everything in this uh, system, because you have plasmons as a cavity, that is a bad cavity, by the way, then you have everything that is fast, ultra fast. So, okay, so we decided to, to, uh, to put a single molecule, in this case, a single anthracene molecule in the in this region, and we were pumping with a few, I mean, we are theoreticians, we were pumping theoretically with a few femtosecond laser poles, and we were interested in looking to the dynamics. Okay, so you apply the same ideas that I put before. <clears throat> you have, uh, this is the, the simple model, first simple model that we, we uh, arrived at, that is basically an harmonic approach for the two potential energy sources. So you have the ground state, and then you have the set the potential energy uh, surface of the set of the states in this blue. Now, <clears throat> if you put the molecule inside this cavity and you achieve a strong coupling, then you are going to create a lower polariton potential energy surface like this one and an upper polariton potential energy surface like this one. The important point of this figure is that if you see the character of each polariton depends on the reaction coordinate. So for example, in this particular case, because the stock shift is so large that you have that from R or well, Q, for, for positive Q, uh, mainly the character of, of the lower polariton is exciton-like, whereas for negative R or Q in this case, that is the reaction coordinate is more cavity-like. For the upper polariton is the other way around, okay? Good, so let's send a pulse to the system. So the idea is we are going to send an ultrasound Short pump, pump pulse for this with this energy. So then the, the nuclear wave packet is launched by this uh, ultra short pump pulse, and then it's going to move following this polaritonic potential energy surface. And the important point is that is, that is going to be ultra fast emission associated to when the wave packet passes the uh, photon like region. Okay, so this is the naive, naive idea that is supported by the, the simulation. In this case, in this lower panel, what I'm putting is just the, um, the, uh, the population or the character basically as a function of, the, of, of time and as, and as a function of the, of the reaction coordinate. And you can see that there is a nice oscillation of the character of the wave packet passing regions where it's more photon-like or more exciton-like. And if you look into the time result photon emission, you observe that by looking at this time difference between these two maxima, you are able to extract information of the motion of the nuclear wave packet. So it's an all optical proving of uh, coherent wave packet motion without the probe. So, so the mission gives you information on when the wave packet passes a given spatial region. Okay, so this is why we call it a polaritonic molecular probe. In this case, we are taking advantage of a very bad cavity like the one associated to plasmonic modes. Okay, what about cavity modified ground state chemical reactions? I mean, in this first part of my talk, I've, I have been talking about uh, <clears throat> a, a electronic strong coupling, let's say. I mean, we are uh, hybridizing an electronic excitations of the order of 
uh, in the optical regime with an optical camera. But there, there have been some experiments, mainly by the group, again, by the Thomas Everson group, in which they show that it's possible to change chemical reaction rate in the ground state under the so-called vibrational strong coupling a thermal equilibrium and with no external driving. So basically, in this, in this case, they are taking advantage of, of the, what is called vibrational electron coupling. So they are hybridizing a vibrational mode inside the molecule with an infrared cavity mode. Okay? And then you have what is called vibropolaritons in this case. Okay? So then you have to work with the cavity in the infrared, and then you have to be on resonance. This energy with this energy. And these are some of the results in this case. And then, okay, I'm not going to enter into details. You can find details in, in all these, these references, but they find that when, when this is resonant with one of the vibrations, that you have, of course, many vibrations, they observe some changes in the chemical reaction rate. Yeah. So as always in, in our group, we try to understand what is the, the physical mechanism of this, of this process. And as always, because an ergonomic molecule is always very complicated, we decide to go for a very simple system. So it's a very model system for a, for a molecule that is the scene Matthew model, in which basically you have, it's, it's very used in, in, in quantum chemistry. So it's a model in which you have three nuclei, okay? Then uh, the, these two in, in the, at the streams uh, are fixed. And then the other one, the central one can be moved. And this is the reaction coordinate associated to, to this movement. And you have one electron. So you have one, one degree of freedom for the electron and one degree of freedom for the nucleus. So, and then everything is uh, encoded in this Hamilton. Okay, so you have the uh, kinetic energy of the nucleus and then you have the, this electron, uh, Hamiltonian of, of, of the electron. And then we are going to put this, this molecule inside the cavity. So then you have to include two terms as, as we said before. Okay, by the way, this is the typical landscape for the reaction in the ground state. You have a reactant and then you have a product and then you have a, a transition barrier in between, okay? So when you include this molecule inside the cavity, basically you have to include two terms, one that is associated to the cavity mode of the, uh, of the cavity and also the uh, coupling between the dipole uh, moment of the molecule that depends now on X and R and the quantized electric field. Okay. So in this thing, because you have only three degrees of freedom, it's very easy to, to, to compute the quantum reaction rate. And it's clear that this is how the uh, reaction rate changes as a function of one, of one over, over the temperature for different coupling strengths. In our case, we are theoreticians, so we can modify very easily the coupling by enlarging this quantized electric field. And you observe that indeed you can change the reaction rate by increasing the coupling strength. Interestingly, the rates depend uh, exponentially on temperature. So it seems, although this is a, a, a full quantum calculation, it seems that the, the transition state theory also operates in this, in this system because the rates depends exponentially on, on temperature. So can we understand this? And for doing that, we are going to use the so-called cavity born of Reheimer approximation that you can find details in this reference, the idea is, is very basic. So in this cavity born of Reheimer approximation, we are going to write the cavity mode as an explicit harmonic oscillator. Instead of using this eta r a, we are going to use p and q. And more importantly, we are going to treat the uh, photon degree of freedom as a, a slow nuclear degree of freedom, because in this case, we have to realize that in this case, the energy of, of the cavity mode is very similar to the energy of the vibration. So we are going to treat the uh, photon degree of freedom as a nuclear degree, of, as, as an additional nuclear degree of freedom. And if you do that, then you are going to see that very nicely that now your electronic potential energy surface is parametric in both the photon uh, uh, component and also on the reaction coordinate. So you have a two-dimensional, you have two degrees of freedom, you have a two-dimensional potential energy surface, and then you can create or you can calculate, in our case, the reaction pathway. Even you can do it analytically by going to the second order in lambda in this perturbation parameter. So we express the quantized electric field as a function of this lambda. So it's a measure of the, of the interaction 
And okay, so this is how this ground state potential energy surface depends on the reaction coordinate and the photon component, let's say. And then interestingly, you, you have two different terms that are proportional one to lambda and the other one to <coughs> lambda squared, sorry. If you minimize with respect to the photonic uh, degree of freedom, you end up with a, an effective uh, potential energy surface. And it's very nice to discover the two terms, one that is a divide-like potential that is proportional to the permanent dipole moment of the molecule, and the other one that is the London-like potential in which is proportional to the uh, polarizability of the molecule. So and then it's, it's quite easy to understand what is happening in this system. So this is the permanent dipole moment associated to this symmetry model that you have at, at r equal to zero is zero, and then you have one maxima and one minima associated to the two uh, minima. And you can observe that this always this term is negative because this is, everything is, is positive here. So basically what it happens is that in, uh, the energy of the transition state doesn't change with the strong coupling, but however the two minima are decrease due to the strong coupling. So in some way you are increasing the potential barrier. Okay, so it's clear that, that indeed you can induce the changes in the, in the reaction rates, in the ground state reaction rates by strong coupling. But that is our, we decided to, to, to change the frequency of the cavity mode. And this is how in our calculations, the reaction rate changes with the, with the energy of the cavity field. And you observe that it's very flat. So that is no resonance effect. And this is different than in the experiments. In our case, this non-resonance effect is consistent with normal chemistry in the sense that transition state theory tells you that the activation barrier is the important parameter and not the details of the pathway. And all the cavities are important. So also we don't obtain a collective enhancement unless permanent dipoles are aligned. So still our theory that you can find more details in this reference is not able to explain the experimental results regarding ground state chemical reactions. So uh, more theoretical uh, work is needed and also more experiments are needed. Okay, so I'm going to pass now to describe uh, long range energy transport mediated by collective strong coupling. Sorry. So, so I'm, I'm going to focus on, on exciton transport. So, the transport of electronic excitations is very important for, for many uh, applications. The typical example is the photosynthesis in which a photon is absorbed in the antenna base plate and is transferred to the reaction center in the form of an exciton, a Frenkel exciton as a technical note. Um, there have been some proposals to use uh, ex excitons in, in transistors. And of course, in, in organic solar cells, the efficiency of the organic solar cell is, depends very much on the diffusion length of the excitons in your system. For example, in this experiment, it was reported that just uh, an increase of the diffusion length from 10 to 15 nanometers can increase the quantum efficiency significantly. The exciton tra transport in, in, in organic material is often very short range of the roughly nanometers and also is incoherent. So can we improve it by making excitons more photonics? The idea, the naive idea behind all this work in, in this direction is to take advantage of the delocalized nature of the polaritonic modes associated to a strong coupling. So, so this is the first model that we developed that it was a very simple model. It was a one dimensional chain of interacting emitters in a cavity that are coupled to reservoirs. And we were trying to reproduce what is a, an organic material. We were including a disorder in the dipole orientation of the quantum emitters and also in the positions. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so the Hamiltonian in this case is, is quite easy. I mean, you have, the, we were including only one cavity mode. So you have the cavity mode, you have your excitons. You have exciton exciton hopping in the absence. I mean, that is the mechanism for transport in the absence of a strong coupling. So it's basically a dipole dipole interaction. And okay, if you include this one dimensional change inside a, a cavity, what you are going to have is interaction between the uh, excitons and the cavity field that is this GI. This is the exciton cavity coupling. Of course, 
you have to include also incoherent processes in your system. You, so you have cavity losses, perfect. You have molecular radiative and non-radiative decay. Because you are treating in organic, uh, uh, organic molecules, molecular defacing, elastic scattering with phonons is an important parameter also. And because you want to simulate a kind of transport experiment, you are going to pump the first molecule and you are interested to see how much of this excitation is uh, transferred to the last uh, quantum emitter in the chain, okay? So then by using the, the tools of quantum optics, you can represent all these incoherent processes as in black terms. So this is the coherent part of the dynamics and this is the incoherent part. So we were, the, in our case, our observable is what we call the exciton conductance that basically is the efficiency of the energy transport. So I have to highlight that this is not the electrical current, okay? So this is energy transport. And we are working uh, in the linear regime. So it's in, in a low pumping uh, scenario. And this is uh, the results. So in this case, what I'm representing is the exciton conductance as a function of the Rabi splitting and the total Rabi, the collective Rabi splitting because we, okay, again, we are theoreticians, so for us it's very easy to, to increase the coupling. For four different uh, examples, you have 60 molecules, 40 molecules, and you can have disorder or no disorder, okay? And of course, when, when uh, you are in the weak coupling regime, the conductance is, is very low. Of course, it's, it's, it's even smaller when uh, you have disorder in your system, and then, uh, uh, okay, you, you don't have uh, disorder, so you have an order one dimensional array, you have the conductor. But in all the cases, as soon as you switch on the strong coupling, you can see that you have a huge increase in the exciton conductance. So there is a strongly rise of exciton conductance as coupling to the electromagnetic mode is increased. And then there is a saturation of the strong coupling of the exciton conductance when the, when the strong coupling is fully established. So in some way, and it's more or less independent on the details of your structure. So basically, the excitons are bypassing the quantum emitters are, are jumping directly from one end to the other. End. Okay. So this is our uh, uh, basic result. And okay, again, in, in the experiments, this this uh, long range energy transport has been uh, supported by by experiments. In this case, by the, in the group of uh, Daniel Sambito. They were using a DVR, a one-dimensional photonic crystal, a truncated one-dimensional photonic crystal as, as a cavity, and they were putting an organic material on top. And they were looking at the uh, propagation length. And in this case, they achieved a propagation length of uh, 120 microns. That is very large. Also, more, more recently, uh, the group of Stephen Forrest had been not made known. They were able not only to, to look for the propagation length of the excitons in this case, but also to to, to analyze the coherence of, of this transport by looking at the self-interference measurements. Okay, they were able to see the interference between these two beams. And they achieved, I mean, they, they reported a, a coherent lens of uh, 20 microns. That is just a demonstration that uh, not only the, the, the range is increased by strong coupling, but the coherence is also increased. Okay, in, in, in our theoretical proposal and, and in all the experiments, the uh, electric field profile was uniform in, this, in the structure. So um, the idea that we had is that uh, perhaps you can harvest excitons by tuning the electric field profile. And this is just a, a proof of concept. In our case, we are using just a very simple uh, plasmonic system that is composed of three metal and nanoparticles. Okay, you, you, so you have uh, organic molecules only in the, in the central one. And we were, okay, in this case, you, you can see by the, the Spanish flag, by the way, that uh, you have the, the, the electromagnetic field profile in this case, cavity one, is concentrated in, in the, let's say, in the North Pole and in the South Pole, and is zero at the Ecuador, okay? So we, we were looking at uh, how the exit on conductance changes from when you have the excitation in emitter A, and it goes to emitter B, that is the nearest neighbor, or to the emitter D that is in the opposite pole, or is in the emitter C that is in the equal. And this is the evolution of this exciton conductance as a function of the Rabi splitting for these three different cases. For the nearest neighbor, basically it doesn't depend very much on the Rabi splitting. And on the uh, Ecuador, 
this all change. But that is a, in, in the case of D, that is where the electric the automatic field is highly localized, you have a huge increase in the conductance as a function of the around speed. So even it's larger, I mean, this is just a proof of concept, but it's even larger, the exciton conductance than to the nearest neighbor. Mm -hmm. okay. In some way, this, this idea of harvesting or uh, energy transfer has been uh, achieved also experimentally in, in this paper in which they were using, uh, and in this case, a fabric per cavity, and they were, instead of uh, hybridizing with the first cavity mode of the system, they were uh, hybridizing with the second electromagnetic mode of the cavity, and they were putting donor molecules in the region of the maximum of this second mode and acceptor molecules in the other maximum or minimum, okay? And in this case, they were able to achieve an energy transfer of 40% at the distance, the distance between donor and acceptor molecules was of the order of 150 nanometers. So it's a, it's a very interesting physical phenomenon, this long range energy transfer. And here we presented the, the quantitative, quantitative explanation of this one, because it's a non-local effect driven by the polaritons, okay, thanks to the delocalized character of the polaritons, but at the end it's driven by local phonons, by the local phonons inside the molecules. Okay, what about the time scale in, in, in energy transport? Normally, energy transport in, uh, in organic materials is, is very, is uh, of the order of because it's in the picosecond scale. It's, it's basically based on the, on, the, on the hopping transport and it's very, uh, uh, okay. So it's in the picosecond scale. So uh, we decided to, to look at how the, 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 the time scale is, is modified also by, by strong coupling by using this very simple uh, cavity field that is the one associated to a single metal particle. So basically, as I said, in the case of weak coupling, in this case, when the, when the Rabi splitting is uh, one milli electron volt, you can see that at the beginning you have the excitation in the meter A, and then you are you want to transfer this excitation to a meter, let's say T. And then you can see that first the transfer of uh, population is going to the uh, localized platform in this case, that is the cavity mode, and at the end, after one picosecond, is transferred with very low efficiency, by the way, to the emitter in D. And this is the same evolution of the population as a function of time for the case in which you have a rapid splitting of 0.3 EV. And then you can see two things. One is that the deficiency is highly increased. You can see here it's 10 up to minus three. But also the time scale is now dominated by the rapid splitting. That you have tens of uh, electron volts in of order of femtoseconds. So this transfer of energy is not only more efficient, but it's also very rapid, okay? So now it can be orders of magnitude faster than, uh, than in the case of uh, weak coupling. Okay, again, this, this ultra fast uh, energy transfer has been verified experimentally in two different, uh, in several experiments, but I have highlighted these two ones, one in the group of David Lissi and the other one in the group of, of Thomas Everson, and they were both uh, reporting uh, ultra fast energy, energy transfer associated to a strong coupling. Well, this is the last uh, work that we did along this direction. So we were interested in looking at uh, how you can uh, modify the, the exciton dynamics in photosynthetic units. Okay, so these are, in this case, we took uh, as an example, light harvesting complexes in purple bacteria. Basically, they are they're quite complicated. The, the, the point is that in this case, of course, because uh, uh, the deficiency is very, is very high. I mean, it's, it's of the 100%, but the time scale is of the 20 or 50 picoseconds. So of course we, we couldn't uh, increase the deficiency of, the, of this uh, photosynthetic unit, but okay, so we decided to put as a uh, prototypical example to put inside the cavity to, uh, to achieve a strong coupling. And as expected, we found that you can uh, increase the, uh, the speed of this transfer process uh, and to have uh, this uh, uh, efficient transfer in the scale of the order of 10 femtoseconds. Okay, okay so in, in this part, I have concentrated on uh, organic material, but this cavity modified chart, uh, chart and energy transport can be also achieved in organic materials. And I, I put this example that was reported last year by the group of uh, Jerome Feist. 
and they were using the typical experiments for the two-dimensional gas with a, a magnetic field, but they, they incorporated a, a new ingredient that it was just a, 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 what they call a LC, LC resonator, that is a cavity mode in the terahertz regime, by the way. And they were looking at the, at the experiments and just to the, the, the magneto resistance along this direction, and they found that you can change the resistivity of the system by a strong cavity. Okay, and then you can see that the, the strong coupling produces a reduction in this oscillation as a function of the magnetic field. So all this charge transport or energy transport uh, modified by, by cavity fields is not only for organic materials, but it's also appears in, in organic materials. You can find details of the explanation in this, in this paper. Okay, so in the last five minutes of my talk, I'm going to talk about very recent result, results on, that perhaps for this audience is more interesting, on how you can manipulate condensed matter by uh, means of a strong coupling. Okay, so it's well known that you can uh, modify material properties by using light. There were some experiments in the 60s, um, in, and I have taken just two of them, in which it was reported that you can increase the critical current of a superconductor if you illuminate the system with coherent microwave radiation, okay? So 60 years ago, basically. So, okay, so this, um, this idea of using light to modify superconductivity was rediscovered uh, in modern times. And now it's, okay, they, they, they put it another name that is more general, that is Floquet Engineering. So in this case, one of the group, more uh, active groups is the group of Andrea Cavalieri, and they were using this idea to induce superconductivity on a stripe order cuprate, and also in this case, three C60 material. And not only, you can use floquet engineering not only to change superconductivity, <clears throat> but also, for example, in this paper, <clears throat> you can induce a transition from paralectic to ferroelectric by using an intense terahertz. So if you look into the, my talk, so it's clear what is next. No? So what about replacing? I mean, the, the problem of, of floquet engineering is that you have to use very intense uh, fields. So the, it has two consequences. One is that your state is changed only trans, in the transient. And also because the, the fields are so intense that you are basically you can damage your, your sample. So the idea is to develop a kind of quantum floquet engineering. The idea is to replace the intense classical light field by a confined cavity electromagnetic field. So there have been many proposals in the last two years along this direction. These are three theoretical uh, papers, two in PRL and the other one in site advances, in which they found theoretically that it's possible to enhance <coughs> the electron-electron interaction mediated by phonons by including uh, these materials inside the cavity. This is our regards superconductivity. Also, the, the, in, this, in this paper by the group of Antoine George, they, they were even more uh, uh, exotic thing like uh, super radiant quantum materials. And more recently, uh, this group of people, they found that uh, also you can induce a paralectic ferroelectric phase transition by incorporating this, um, this material inside the cavity. Of course, all, all of these papers are theoretical proposals, and, but the only experiment that is, has shown some um, um, enhanced superconductivity induced by strong coupling is this one, again, uh, uh, by the group of Thomas Everson, that is just in the archive. So the idea they were using, and this is a very clever idea because they were using a gold mirror as a cavity. So they were using surface plasma polyton, but in the infrared regime, and they were using a superconductor in powder uh, form, and uh, they were immersed in a polymer, and two types of polymers. They were using polyestyrene and PMMA, and the idea was to hybridize this phonomode that is the responsible of superconducti superconductivity in this material with the infrared surface plasmon propagating along the surface. Okay? So they were using two different um, uh, polymers because in the case of polyesterine, the hybridization, I mean, they were using this polymer uh, as a mediator in the interaction between 
the phonon mode and the cavity mode, because the direct coupling between this phonon mode and the cavity field is very small. So they were using this mode or this mode as a mediator in this interaction. And this is the, the important thing. They were able to, by using a squid magnetometer, they were able to uh, measure the, uh, the critical temperature. And uh, they found that when <clears throat> this is the critical temperature when they have only rubidium 3 C60 and the polyesterine, that is of the order of 30 Kelvin. But when they included this material on top of the gold mirrors, they observed an increase of the uh, transition temperature from 30 to 45. And when they were using this as a mediator in which you can see that here, the line width of this uh, phonon mode is, is very large. So in this case, the coupling is not so good. They didn't observe this, this increase in the, in the critical temperature, okay? So this is the only experiment showing this kind of ideas. Okay, so this is the summary. <clears throat> I hope that I have been able to deliver my message in this very strange or very weird scenario. So I didn't have time to talk about fundamentals of strong coupling. I mean, I have preferred to focus on the, on the results, but in our group, we have been working very hard trying, I mean, trying to, um, to find the best theoretical framework to deal with a strong coupling between organic molecule and nanophotonic structure. That is not easy because if you take the tools of uh, cavity QED, normally the organic molecule is a two-level system, as I mentioned before, and the cavity field is basically a bosonic mode. So we have been working very hard trying to introduce increased complexity, both in the description of organic molecules and nanophotonic cavities. And at the end, I mean, we have developed a, a framework that is able to combine microscopic QED with tensor network framework that is able to treat at equal footing, electronic, vibronic, and photonic degrees of freedom. Okay, so this is, you can find details in all, these, in all these papers. And as regards the two main points of my talk, polaritonic chemistry, it's clear uh, that you can modify molecular structure and photochemical reaction through a strong coupling. You can strongly suppress photoisomerization process, or you can create new reaction pathways based on that. It's clear that uh, ground state chemical reaction can be modified, but still, I mean, many experiments are needed and more theories are needed in order to understand the, the basic mechanism. And okay, we have also devised uh, what we call a polaritonic molecular clock that you can use, uh, you can uh, do like a pump probe experiments of nuclear dynamics without the probe. Regarding energy transport, it's clear that a strong coupling, thanks to the delocalized character of the polaritonic modes, you can have a dramatic enhancement of the energy transport. By tuning the electromagnetic mode allows the exit on harvesting. Is it? Sorry, uh, you can, uh, the conductance map follows the electromagnetic field profile. So you can play with the mode profile to specifically take one station from one place to another, long range energy transfer, and, uh, and the transfer is, is ultra fast because in this case it's mediated by the Rabi splitting and not by the hopping mechanism. And the outlook for the future, and perhaps for this audience again is, is more interesting, that you can indeed uh, manipulate condensed matter by coupling to vacuum electromagnetic fields. I have put some examples of enhanced superconductivity, but I'm sure that several other quantum many body phenomena are going to appear in the very near future. Um, with that, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this great talk. So, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. So now the talk is open for questions. So we do have one question in the chat by uh, Tero Haikila. So how does the POPES work? when you have a large number end of molecules? In other words, how do you take into account the entropic contribution from the dark states? Well, I mean, I didn't have time. I don't know. Um, basically, in the, I can put, again, I can share the screen. Yes, of course, if you want. Um, the thing is that, um, of course, the, the, uh, oh, I don't know how to. Ah, okay. Sorry. 
that is a problem uh, out. The thing is that uh, I didn't have, of course, I only uh, put the case of a single molecule. Um, that is that is here, here. But uh, in this in this reference, we we did the calculation for a, a, a for a collection of molecules, and um, the, even in this case, for the case of photoisomerization process, we were able to see that even when you have a collection of molecules, um, uh, if you excite at the at the lower polariton, of course, then you can have uh, the same effect. So it doesn't depend on the number of molecules. Of course, if uh, you excite at a different molecule, and then you have to take into account the, the, the dark states, because these are, these are the lower polariton and the upper polariton. Sorry, I'm going to put. Um, uh, sorry. So this is only for one molecule. But if you have a collection of molecules, you are going to have between the two, between the lower polariton and the upper polariton, you are going to have a collection of dark states. Of course. If you excite the system in the dark states, the dark states are, are going to play an important role. But if you excite the lower proton, the physics is going to be very similar. This is my uh, answer to that question. But you can find more details in this in this reference if you want. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there more questions or comments by the audience? You can raise your hand and go ahead. <clears throat> So if not, I, I so you you presented a one-dimensional model for energy transport, yeah. where you you put the disorder in there, right? Yeah. So it seems to me that usually disorder in one dimensions is very important, right? In your case, yeah, of course it's, it's quite important in, in, in one dimension. But the, mm -hmm. the, the thing is that when when you incorporate it in a, in a cavity. Mm -hmm. You are surpassing all the disorder, no? and at the end, you take mm -hmm. advantage of the, the localized character, and then you can jump one exciton from one end to the other. So this, is, mm -hmm. this, is, this is the basic idea. Okay. Yeah, of course, in one dimension, disorder is, is, is quite important. Mm -hmm. the, the problem is that it's, it's not easy to, to go to two dimensions, for example. We, we thought on, on going to two dimensions and to see mm -hmm. how it uh, works, but, uh, but uh, well, it's difficult to, to do it from, from a from a numerical perspective. Okay, thank you. I see Tero Haikila raised his hand. Maybe you can go ahead, Tero, and place a question. Okay, thank you. Uh, I could actually make a follow-up to the question question that you, uh, or to your answer uh, related to this uh, dark state contribution. So, uh, when you say that if you excite the, the system in the lower polarity state, mm -hmm. are you referring to uh, some like pulsed excitation that you kind of, how, how do you do this excitation? Because as far as I understand, many of the experiments are actually done in the stationary state where you drive. Oh, yeah, exactly. System, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, in, in our case, it's not. Then, we, we, then there's we, a lot of finite line width, and then there's a possibility of ending up in, in, in some other states. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that this this uh, affects a lot on the ensuing dynamics. Exactly. No, no. In, in our case, we are starting with the, from the lower part. And experimentally, it's true that you should do it with an ultra fast uh, with an ultra fast pulse and put it in in, in that one. Yeah. Uh, experimentally, it's much more complicated. Yeah. And then in the, the experiment, even that in that case, there is some finite probability that you actually did it didn't end up in the lower part of the state. And since there are n of these dark states, uh, there is much higher probability that you end, ended up there, even though that kind of uh, uh, you would be driving uh, with, the, with the pulse that sort of corresponds to the transition to the lower part yeah. of the state. But also, you have all to take this into, be taken into account then. Yeah, but you have to take into account also that the, from the dark state you can uh, go to the lower polariton. Of course, the, the, here I, I know that there is a, a story about the entropy of all the dark states and everything, but uh, in this case, is we are not included in entropy or whatever. It's just uh, uh, okay. It's just energy, and of course, I guess that uh, of course, the, from the lower polariton, you can, you can uh, from the dark state, you can end up in the lower polariton. But the question is then: Is this Popper's picture even relevant? Because well, no. all these things that are actually relevant in the experiment, right? Yeah, I think they are, they are relevant. Okay, I cannot. 
Okay. So maybe I have a question if I may ask. Go ahead, Ramon. So when you when you go from your the first part of the talk, or well, the main part of the talk with molecules and so on, and then you move towards these condensed matter systems and quantum materials and so on. I have kind of a technical question. I mean, I understand that you can describe all these early systems with the language of quantum optics and polaritons, maybe some Lindblad equation and so on. But when you go to a quantum material, how do you incorporate? How do you incorporate the you know the many degrees of freedom that may be relevant in this quantum material? Yeah, that's that's a very good point, Ramon. I mean, because uh, basically you, you have to uh, to do very simplified models. I mean, in order to do this kind of things, I mean, you have to do a very simplified model for the for the superconductor, and then what you are assuming that you have this collective mode that is coupling that is coupled to the the cavity mode. So they are very simplified models. So you cannot. The, the problem of this of this new area of research is that you cannot rely, let's say, in a, a density functional theory or whatever, because it's so complex. You have a microscopic material, and then and you have a microscopic uh, cavity. So then you have many degrees of freedom. So it's not easy to, to do it from the from a theoretical perspective. Okay, so it's that is it's, it's just an open question. In fact, in the in the I don't have my screen here. I don't know how to do it. But uh, there is a debate as regards what is the best way to uh, a controversy between between different groups, theoretical groups, on how to describe this kind of system. Okay. Thank you. Okay. More questions? Maybe I have a brief question about the last system you 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 showed, which might be superconducting, uh, or might have an increase in the critical temperature. So how, how thick is this this uh, this layer? Do you know? I mean, what is the length scale One, associated with this with these modes? No, the thing is that at the end it doesn't depend on mm -hmm. the uh, the thickness of the organic material has to be such that uh, you can have a strong coupling with your plasma. So everything is controlled by the decay length of the decay, uh, not the decay length, uh, the decay of the plasma into the into the organic film. Mm -hmm. So. So basically, you need to have the, the, the thickness of the uh, organic material has to be of the order of, of the exponential decay of the of the plasmic field. I see. Okay. Okay. So Thank you very you, much. If you put more, if you put more uh, organic molecules, then you don't observe any change. I see. I guess this thickness is small, right? Yeah, it's a small. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't okay. know the number, but you can find it in, in that one. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, are there more questions or comments? So maybe Ramon, we can take a group photo. Yeah, we? yeah, I was about, <laughs> I, I was about to say this. So maybe everybody can switch on their cameras and we go to gallery mode and everybody can take just a screenshot, like a group picture of the, <laughs> of the event. So let's do this. Maybe we you have to stop sharing. Stop sharing, FJ. Oh, sorry. Right. And now everybody's Great. on. So just uh, take a uh, screenshots and see if we get a nice picture out of this. Okay, so thank you very much for attending. It's been a great session. So see you tomorrow in another session. Bye. Or later this afternoon. Yeah. Or later this <laughs> afternoon, of course. <laughs> bye. Ciao. Ciao. Bye-bye.